Let's continue our whirlwind tour through the history of English. In the last video, we looked at the transformation from Proto-Indo-European to Old English to Middle English. In this video, I want to give you some highlights of what happened from the 1400s to the present day. I want to start by focusing on the orthography of English. Have you noticed that the orthography of English is kind of quirky, that sometimes you can write the same sound with different letters and so forth? or if you studied something like German or Spanish or Finnish, the orthography looks a lot more regular than the orthography of English. Part of this started in the 1400s. So before the 1400s, people wrote English in however they heard their own English. So these words would be pronounced mat, gasse, spawn, gosse, bitte. Also notice that the this one sounds o, kind of like our IPA symbol for o. This one sounds mat, kind of like the IPA symbol for e. So this is when printing was introduced to Europe, people started printing their books as they spoke in the 13 and 1400s with words that sounded like mat, gas, spawn, and gos. But then between the 1400s and the 1700s, all of the vowels of English changed. They changed in what's called the Great Vowel Shift. One vowel pushed another one, pushed another one, pushed another one into a different direction. So for example, if you had a word with the sound A, like mat or gas, this one went up a notch in our vocalic triangle and became E, as in meat or geese. If you had the central back vowel, like gose and spawn, this sound was kicked up one bit in the vocalic triangle and became u, as in spoon or goose. So even though it, the, the, writing, uh, was, the writing was meant to represent the word as it was pronounced in the 1300s, now the sound had changed. What happened if you were a sound on the highmost part of the vocalic triangle? Then basically you were kicked down. This happened to words like beta, where the E was kicked down into the center and became bait and ultimately bite. And by the way, the A must have been lost in the 1400s as well when the K system was uh, eliminated from English, because if there's no case in English, this final sound is not doing a lot of work signaling any morphemes, and so people uh, stopped pronouncing it. So from bitte, it became bit, bait, bite. So as you can see, all of the system of the vowels rotated, and this uh, encompassed the process that started in the 1400s and ultimately ended in the 1700s. A word like Mouth would be pronounced mouth, mouth, and ultimately mouth. A word like name would be pronounced name, nam, nam, name, name, ultimately. So you can see that this th change took a long time, but it made it so that things were no longer written with the sounds with, uh, they were pronounced with. Notice, by the way, that this pronunciation is exactly, uh, the old pronunciation is exactly the same as we would have in German now, Name, for example. But all the sounds of English changed, but the orthography remained the orthography of the 13 and 1400s. Because writing is something that you don't want to change a lot. If you've learned how to write when you were a kid, would you like your language to completely change its orthography? There's a lot of resistance to that kind of process. So people who have learned to write are gonna say, I don't want to learn how to read and write all over again. I'm gonna keep writing like I've always written. And so there will be an inertia to continue writing the older forms, which has continued to this day. Uh, we still write our words as if as they sounded in the 13 and 1400s. But the great vowel shift changed all of the sounds of English. So in the 16 and 1700s, one important thing that happened to English is that it expanded throughout the planet through the process of colonialism of Britain. So uh, English all of a sudden was in the Southern Pacific, in Africa, in South Asia, and in the Americas. And of course, Britain had a lot of dialects, but this expansion process created many more dialects of English around the planet. 
It also created creoles of English, as we saw last week. This is an example from Tok Pisin from Papua New Guinea. Headlight belong you is headlights belonging to you. Your headlights. So, something very interesting happens when you have many dialects of a language. As I hope I've convinced you over the last couple of weeks, all varieties of human languages are equally complex. They have syntax and morphology and phonology, and they can express all these ideas. Every variety of human language could do that. Could do that. But there might be one dialect, and particularly the speakers of a dialect, which eventually come to amass more power, maybe political power or economical power. Maybe the people, people who live in London start amassing more money and more power over everyone else. Because of this, they're the ones who make the law, who make the newspapers, who write the books. And ultimately, they'll make the claim that because they do all of this, their dialect is better or more correct than everyone else's. And eventually they will succeed in claiming that they speak the standard form of the language. So there are certain dialects of English, for example, um, upper class dialects in London or dialects in the East Coast of the United States, where their speakers managed to get economical power political power and therefore claim that the way they spoke was the correct way to speak English. This has nothing to do with linguistics. Notice that their dialects are not structurally different. Their dialects are not better at communicating anything because all human language can communicate equally well. But eventually a process started where they claimed to be speaking in a more clear or a more logical language. Eventually, they had self-promoted their dialect of English into being the standard variety of English. In the current world, there's two main standards. There's uh, the American English standard and the one called received pronunciation, which is based on upper class London, basically. This is a famous quote from a Yiddish linguist, Max Weinreich. A language is a dialect with an army and a navy. We all speak a dialect of a language, but the ones that get called language, the official or standard language, are the ones with more power to perform this claim, which is political. It's not about linguistics. It's about politics. Sadly, in the process, uh, the people with the more power might begin a process where they stigmatize the way other people speak. Because, of course, they want to keep their status as the ones that speak the better language. Therefore, they can begin campaigns that say that the other speakers speak bad or sound dumb or are wrong. And sadly, this is a thing that we see throughout planet Earth. Look at these examples from English. He done good. I would like one of them jam buddies. She won't be no trouble. Of course, you've been told throughout your education that you shouldn't speak like this. But take a moment to think of why shouldn't you speak or write like that? Are those the sentences, the ones that are, that are called regional here, are not communicating any less? They're communicating the exact same meanings. They are perfectly well structured, uh, structured sentences in English. It's because we consider one of the dialects to have more prestige and to be correct, even though there's no linguistics, linguistic basis for that claim. This has happened in English in the last 300 years. There's several dialects, like the ones in, the, um, in some parts of the US and some parts of the UK, which have become the standard. There's others which are in the inner circle, for example, from Australia and New Zealand. And there's other Englishes in the outer circle, the English of India, Nigeria, the Philippines, for example, which if, if, uh, if you taught a class of English, students abroad wouldn't think that these are prestigious enough for them to learn. They would want to learn to pronounce like Americans. That being said, these varieties continue to exist because they're very useful in, in indexing local identities. If you are from India, for example, you're going to be you're going to want to be able to communicate in a, a UK received pronunciation uh, accent when you go to Britain, for example, but it's but you're also going to want to do the accent of English of India when you're in India to communicate 
that you belong there and that you want to connect to the people there. So you can go back and forth between them to project a certain identity. That is a very, very summarized summary of the history of English. Um, it, English orthography is weird because its sounds changed and its orthography remained the same as it was in the 13 and 1400s. The main change is called the Great Vowel Shift. English has spread throughout the world, which has met, led to many dialects, but also to the phenomenon of some dialects claiming to be essentially better than others. And this claim is political. It has no linguistic basis. And that's where we are. In the next video, I'm going to tell you a little bit more of how we can know that one language is related to another.